That's great. Thanks, Chair. Thank the indulgence of the committee and the witnesses for allowing us to backtrack a little, uh, backtrack a little because I was not available earlier. I do have some general questions to ask um, about the Chief's statement, but I'm, while we've got the naval folk at the table, I might just start with submarines if I could. Um, during the last estimates, the $214 million study and analysis of future submarine capability was discussed. There wasn't a lot of information there at the time, um, although the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee was briefed in camera um, some months ago now on the progress on that study. Could you just provide us with whatever you're able to, um, to put on the table in an open session with where that study is up to? Yeah, I'll get uh, Admiral Moffat to uh, discuss that, Senator. Uh, Rear Admiral Rowan Moffat, Head of the Future Submarines Program. Uh, it's uh, not a single study, Senator. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fairly massive raft of studies which uh, fundamentally occupy about six different groups, if you like, and I'll go through each group and I can go into each group in more detail as you wish. Um, look, in the interest of time and also that I've held things up a little, I might ask you to table whatever you're able to for the committee rather than going in through each of the six groups in detail. I mean, I think I know what you're referring to, but could you provide us with some of that material in writing? Uh, I'm happy to do that on, yeah. uh, I'll take, take your question on notice and provide you with a brief. Yeah, much appreciated. And I'll, I'll just keep these reasonably high level and then I'll move on. Um, I'm interested to know whether the study or the, the tranche, the package of studies will be available prior to the release of the 2013 Defence White Paper. Uh, we'll be uh, progressing, obviously, through them. They won't all be completed. We're going to be doing studies related to the future submarine program for some years. 20. Yep. Sorry? Yeah. No, understood. Um, so can you tell us what you, you would anticipate would be in the public domain at the time of the release of the 2013 Defence White Paper? Uh, well, the, the reports of the studies themselves, Senator, are obviously are released if they're releasable, and some of them are into uh, classified technologies and, of course, will not be releasable. Um, and, and whether or not they're released is a, is a matter for the Minister. Uh, the reports that, that uh, we have will have completed by the, um, uh, by the time of the 2013 White Paper will be provided to the Minister. It'll be up to him whether he decides to release them or not. OK. I'm going to come to the question of the drafting of the White Paper in a moment, but I'm just interested to know, while we've got you here, um, the degree of collaboration or the degree to which you're in contact with that other process. Is, it, is, there, is there any formal or informal exchange of information or not? Yes, there is, Senator. When the, uh, the white paper writing team require information that is sensibly sourced from me, that's what they, they are doing and that has been the case also with the four structure review process. All right, thank you. Before we move on, can you then just maybe provide us with at the very high level the six different tranches yep. of this work? And yes, then we'll, indeed. Then we'll change the subject. Thank yes, you. Yes, indeed. Um, there are four option sets, as we've outlined and as was announced by the Minister and the Prime Minister on the 3rd of May, and there's work going on in each of those. The first relates to the military off-the-shelf option set, and we have, uh, at the moment, ongoing analysis of um, the responses to requests for information to each of those uh, um, companies that produce those submarines. That's in progress now and uh, coming fairly close to the end. Uh, we have work in progress in respect of uh, combat system. Uh, and the range of submarine combat systems available either through the uh, US sources, which is the one we have at the moment, or commercial sources, uh, which is the other six, I think, um, submarine combat system vendors. That, those requests for information are out with the vendors now and yeah. will be analysed. Uh, that leads us to an examination of the second option set, which is the uh, off-the-shelf submarines that might be modified with our selection of combat system. Yep. Um, so they, uh, the second of the, the combat system work feeds the information that allows us to complete work on the option set number two. Um, option set number three, which is an evolved off-the-shelf um, submarine, including Collins. Uh, there's work we're in the process of negotiating at the moment to have uh, a series of studies uh, done into that suite of options. Uh, the fourth option set, which would be a new design, we'll be establishing a team to do that work. Uh, we're working towards doing that now. We're in the process of doing that now. Uh, that work won't be completed by the time of the white paper, neither will the option three suite of work be completed um, by the uh, time of the white paper. The, so-called specifier or land-based engineering development propulsion system development uh, facility 
The report is in on that and being analysed to develop options that will feed into a first pass consideration by government. And the final, uh, the sixth, I think, if I count correctly, that's the sixth, it's the sixth set of, of work is a fairly complex and diverse set of studies being done uh, on our behalf, either by or through the Defence Science and Technology Organisation, and, and covers a, a quite a wide range of uh, technologies, the detail of which I'm more than happy to provide you in, in my written answer. Yeah, much appreciated. So we've got four different op uh, we've got four different options. Then we've got a study into combat systems specifically, and the DSTO work that makes up your six. Thank you. Um, would you describe yourself without giving anything secret away as being on budget and on time, as far as where you hoped to be by this time in the in the schedule? Uh, I'd say we're not doing too badly. Not doing too badly. All right, at the record That's show. forensic accounting. Too. Yes, so it is. <laughs> All right, uh, nothing to report. Thank you very much. I'll leave that there on submarines. Um, Senator Johnson made some comments before um, relating to the savings that are being made to healthcare facilities within the ADF, and I'd just like to briefly return to that topic if I could. Um, the 2009 Independent Dunt Review made 52 recommendations for drastic improvements that needed to be made within the ADF to better accommodate the mental health needs of soldiers and veterans. Um, and the 2010 ADF Mental Health Study found that nearly a quarter of the ADF population, one in five, um, or 22 per cent or thereabouts, experienced a mental disorder in the previous 12 months. And this uh, issue, I guess, has been given sharper relevance by Major General Cantwell's remarkable account um, of his military career. Could you tell us what safeguards are in place to ensure that the cuts that are occurring will not impact on the service provided with troops who are needing assistance with those sort of illnesses? Uh, uh, we remember Robin Walker, Commander Joint Health. Um, Senator, there are no cuts to the delivery of mental health services. Um, there is no change to the delivery of mental health services. And in fact, we've, uh, under the Dunt review, there's um, uh, a significant amount of additional money that has been provided, which is then continuing in the outer years of our budget to provide um, mental health care services. Okay. Um, and may, we might be traversing ground that, that Senator um, Johnson already covered, but so you can confidently say that of the, the uh, savings and the cuts that have been imposed in this current budget cycle across the forward estimates, these mental health services for, for returned service people uh, have been completely quarantined from those. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. It's what uh, that's what I no, the, think you the, said. Vice Chief of Defence Force. No, the focus is still there on mental health. If anything, there's been an increased focus in the last couple of years on that. Yeah. And they're not returned servicemen. As it, as That's not the board. good term. It's, it, they're, they're still serving members. Uh, what we're doing at the moment is making sure that uh, you know, before Dunt, and Dunt did highlight that there were some cracks in the system, we've filled in those, those cracks and we're trying to make it a seamless system. And then as our uh, soldiers, Airmen, women, sailors, then transition into a DVA system. We're making sure that that's a seamless transition right across the board. Also, importantly, with the mental health space, we're taking into account the needs of the families in all this. So there has been a far greater, or far greater focus on this in the last couple of years. We don't intend reducing that. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you for that. Um, I want to go to the the Afghanistan drawdown. And again, I suspect this was probably raised um, uh, in earlier lines of questioning. Um, I'm just interested in a basic update, I guess, as to where our uh, the, the posture that's been adopted by our conventional forces, and we'll leave the special operations folk until later, um, as far as withdrawing from Afghanistan goes. Senator General Hurley, the Chief of the Defence Force. Uh, just a context again, Senator, you'll be aware, uh, Lisbon, NATO summit in Lisbon uh, 2010, uh, determined a four-year program Four year course uh, with the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan uh, for transition from an ISAF led operation to uh, restoration of Afghanistan's sovereignty for responsibility for its own uh, internal and external security. Uh, that transition process uh, was to occur in a number of tranches of provinces and districts uh, whereby 
ISAF, NATO and the government of Afghanistan would determine uh, which districts, sorry, which provinces and or districts uh, were ready uh, to transition and those uh, tranches, uh, those, each of those tranches would vary in size and number of uh, provinces and districts depending yes. on availability Could. and the performance of the uh, Afghan National Security Forces. There have now been determined to be five tranches. Uh, the first three have been commenced and entered into. Um, our forces operating with the 4th Brigade in Aruzgan province um, entered into tranche three and that for us commenced on the 17th of July and that included all the districts uh, within the Aruzgan province. Uh, as that process has moved forward then, uh, we have been of course adhering to the ISAF campaign plan for about how transition occurs and that means ad adopting and adapting, sorry, adapting the model by which we deliver uh, assistance training, uh, mentor and advisory uh, functions to the ANA in particular. Um, within the 4th Brigade, just to remind people, there are six CANDACs plus the Brigade Headquarters. Uh, four of those CANDACs or battalions are pure infantry battalions. The other two, one is a combat uh, support uh, battalion, which is artillery and engineers primarily, and the other is a combat service support, which is your logistics. All right. Um, we've been mentoring all of those uh, uh, units over the last number of years. Uh, the four infantry battalions, um, one of them is being declared to be capable of conducting uh, independent operations. That's the third CANDAC in the Mirabad Valley. And on the 7th of October, uh, it, we formally stepped back from providing advisers. Does that, uh, General, does that mean we've withdrawn Australian forces from the forward operating bases in that valley? That's correct. We have, so we have nobody there? That's correct. Okay. So patrol base Wally uh, was the last patrol base we were occupying with them and 7th of October there's a parade there and we ceased. So the patrol them. bases still exist but they're now occupied by ANSF in Thailand? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, we all, uh, currently then we're out in three other patrol bases or forward operating bases uh, with the other three CANDACs and as they're uh, deemed ready under the ISAF uh, system, uh, we will step back from those. The fourth and fifth CANDACs, which are the two specialist CANDACs, will continue to do work on them because they were raised later uh, than the other two and they're more the specialist nature and these only take longer to evolve uh, into uh, effective units. Uh, we also continue to uh, advise at the brigade level in uh, Tarancot and also what's known as the uh, OCCP, which is the uh, where we pull together the security forces, the government, the uh, yeah. police, national and the NDS General, uh, do you want together. To... Sorry. So that process is working its way through now and as we've said before, it'll take us 12 to 18 months uh, to step through that tranche three transition process. If everything goes according to plan, and you've, you've mentioned ISAF timetables there a couple of times, can you provide us with an estimate of when all Australian forces would be withdrawn from the forward operating bases? Um, by the end of this year. By the end of this year? Yep. So we will then be maintaining the presence in Tarancot, Kandahar and a small number of personnel we'll be in, in Kabul. Kabul Just the Kandahar, Tarancot, still in Aruzgan because yep. you refer to special forces and so forth. We still have those other assets. We'll get, we'll get to those. So that, that withdraws a number of people. Does that mean our physical presence is withdrawing or we just have larger numbers of people based in Tarancot for the time? No, uh, over time the, the numbers will change. Um, but there are ups and downs in this over the next 12 months. Uh, Senator, you may have read in my uh, opening statement that we'll send 65 Air Force personnel out to take over security responsibilities at the base. That will add to the number. Is that because our colleagues from, I forget where it was now. Slovakia. That they're, they're on their way out. Well, they've readjusted their position. Uh, Slo Slovakia has small uh, armed forces and small budget to spend on this, and they've decided they're continuing with the mentoring and advising task, and they've got to pick up another task, which I'm not at liberty to say they'll need to announce that in the, in the future themselves. Okay. Uh, but to do that, they need to balance off their investment, so they've yep. uh, taken, you know, stopped doing that particular task. So by, with that aside, by the end of this year, we'll be out of the FOBs, we'll have withdrawn to Kandahar and Tarankot principally. Um, do you have an estimate of the size of the force that we'll still have in Afghanistan by the end of this year? Um, 
Yeah, it'll be about uh, 1,300 or so, 1,400, 1,400. So about 200, a net, yeah. net drawdown of about 200. Roughly, yes. Okay. Um, but it will grow again, slightly again next year, because uh, we will start putting in the redeployment force. Uh, that's going to help us extract ourselves okay. out so, of the country. So let's come to that. Uh, Tarancot is now a small city. How much of that equipment needs to be airlifted out? And can you just talk us through the logistics of of uh, how much of Tarancot you expect, will, of the base, I mean, will be left when we're gone? Uh, I can't give you any specifics of that because a lot of that is still being determined. Uh, that will be a number of major factors come into play in this. Uh, once we know what the US plan is for the next two years in terms of reduction of their force sizes, uh, uh, when ISAF through NATO has completed its uh, extraction planning to get the different force uh, from the different countries out of uh, Afghanistan, um, and for us to determining what the most cost effective way is to move certain types of equipment either by air or by road, which lines of communication are going to be open for what sort of period. So there's a lot of factors in play. Uh, as you're aware, we've had a team working on this uh, for a number of months. We can't come to finality on that until some of those other factors come into play. When uh, so yeah. I do have people that are working with NATO, uh, Brunson and SHAPE uh, to help us come to understand what that might look like. I think the next question was, when will I know? Uh, I, I would anticipate early in the, or in the first quarter of next year, uh, because I need to start moving kit out, uh, yeah. because there will be a lot, of, a lot of stuff to get out, not from just us, uh, but from all no. of the ISAF countries. Recognise that. Um, is it likely then that the, the Special Operations Task Group will remain by themselves in Tarancot, or they will find themselves no, redeployed we, somewhere we, else? Sorry. Um, the next sort of point in that evolution in the transition is that uh, on the 18th of October, this Friday, or tomorrow, uh, we will take over command of CTU, uh, the combined team of Ruskin, and therefore responsible for uh, operations within the Ruskin province until uh, 31st of December 2014, or decided otherwise by ISAF. That will require us to maintain a small command element in. Uh, Aruzgan until the end of 2014. Uh, that will need life support, force protection and so forth. Um, and the Special Operations Task Group will continue to operate over that period. I anticipate it will change slightly in its design and functionality in 2014 because, as you're aware, the government uh, has indicated that it is looking at a continuing uh, uh, deployment to Afghanistan post-2014, haven't made decisions on whether or not they'll have an SF element in or not, but if it is, we'll start making some changes in 2014 to position ourselves for that. Well, as, as somebody who uh, has the Swanbourne Barracks as a part of my electorate, I've got a keen interest to know from a local perspective as well as a foreign policy perspective, how long those units who undergo some of the most dangerous work that is done in Afghanistan will be in that country? A special Operations Task Group in one form or another will be there at least until the 31st of December 2014. Okay. And shall government determine uh, it will evolve into something different uh, post that. Are you, are you uh, I don't know if you're alluding and just clarify this if I've got it wrong, that they will transition to more of a force protection role than the kind of expeditionary work that they're doing at the moment? Or is no, that, I'm not. Not, you're not saying that, thank you. Um, the, the war is costing the country about $1.3 billion a year this might be a question for the Minister, actually. I, I'm not sure who to direct this to. Does that money go back to consolidated revenue once we are completely out of the country, or mostly out of the country, or does it remain within the defence budget? Uh, it's not within the defence budget. It's, uh, it's it comes on no win, no loss. So there's, uh, that funding is available to government. OK. I think that answers that quite elegantly. Did you want to go to a break? OK. So we'll yep. come back so shortly. We'll um, go to a break now until 3... 45. Sure. Was, yes. Sorry, could we just get an indication who you might want yep. from now until 6.30 yep. uh, would be we'll, good? Uh, so 3.45, then Senator Lud Ludlam will have another 10 minutes, which should complete. Just, I can give you an indication of where I'm going Please. next, yep. if you like. Um, I've got uh, a number of questions to ask about the Defence White Paper. 
<clears throat> then uh, the basing of United States, I'll use the word basing, the it's presence. Basing. The, the rotation presence. of the United States Marine, Marine Corps through We're not going Darwin. through that again. Yes. Thank you very much, Senator. The presence Chair. of US. Chair. No, um, just give Chair. us a moment. Sorry. Um, Explain of US himself. troops in Australia and then a number of other things, including um, procurement, particularly around drones. They're not drones, Senator. We've done this we'll before as well. And then, the aerial vehicles. Yes. and then just to wrap up, I've got a couple of questions which are somewhat historical in nature about Tenex and contracts with yeah. Tenex. So and that will all be in 10 minutes. Chair. Chair. And then we will I'll consult, um, but I presume we'll go um, back into Navy if that's what, yeah, if that's we'll, what we'll Senator Johnson wants. And we also have to deal with uh, Army before we lose the Look, Chief of Army at 4.30. Well, well that's, that's what I was just going to say, Chair. If, if General Morrison has to leave by 4, perhaps we could have... Oh, 4.30. Well, I was just wondering if we could have Do Senator I'm Johnson sure. with the Chief of Army when we resume. No, I've sorted no it out with Senator, Senator Johnson. Scientist. Oh, have you? Okay. Yeah, we'll go to a break now. Thank you. Chair? Oh, I has got an answer.
Deal with me. Okay. Um, all right. We don't have a minister with us, so this could get completely out of hand. Um, can I just ask? Well, let's start with the defence white paper, the 2013 defence white paper. I think last time I asked, we, we weren't able to identify a lead author. <clears throat> Could you please provide us with an update as to where the 2013 defence white paper process is up to and who's actually writing it? Mr Sergeant, we'll answer soon. Thanks. Um, white, white papers are um, government policy documents, so... Sorry, Mr Sergeant, I wasn't here for oh, early sorry, sessions. Uh, Could you just identify? Sergeant, Deputy Secretary of Strategy. Thanks. Um, <coughs> white papers are um, government policy documents, so um, when they're approved by government in the strictest um, sense of the term, the government's the author of the white paper. That said, um, what's happening within defence is that we're doing a lot of um, work to support the development of a text, essentially. Uh, that work includes um, research, um, the development of um, various drafts of um, parts of the white paper and so on. And over the next few months, there'll be a process of, um, um, of ministerial consideration okay. of that. I'm sorry, I just want to come to the question I actually asked. Is there a lead author and can you identify who that is? Um, well, I'm responsible for ensuring the development of a draft. Okay. That makes you the lead author? Well, I just don't think author is a, a sort of sensible term when you're talking about government policy documents, because that's not the way they're developed. And, Senator, there'll be many contributors. There, I, no, I understand that. OK. Um, but, but for the purposes of the discussion, Mr Sargent, it's you. Yes. As, as overall. OK, yeah. thanks. Um, has an exact release date been specified? No. OK. Has a date when the document would be submitted to the Minister for final approval been identified? Uh, we, we are consulting with the Minister regularly, so um, uh, I would expect a, a reasonably mature draft to be available by the end of the year, early next year. Yep, okay. But no identified date during 2013. There's a national security, I'm not sure what to call it, and the people I spoke to yesterday weren't sure either, whether it's a national security statement or a strategy or a plan or something, it's still a bit up in the air. Um, but I'm, I'm keen to understand, because that I would have thought would be establishing the broader national security context into which a defence white paper would fit. Yes, is that, that, is that, that reasonable? That, yes, that work is being undertaken by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet yeah. through the National Security Advisor. And we would ensure that any um, defence policy fitted within that. Okay, so are we going to see the National Security Statement, or whatever I call it, strategy, prior to the publication of the Defence White Paper? Well, well that's really up to the, to the government. So, um, I mean, it's, it's not something within our control, it's a decision no, by the government. But I, are you taking your guidance from National Security Statement, or are you working in a vacuum? No, we work closely with um, our colleagues across government to ensure that uh, our policy um, is, is consistent. So okay. we, don't, we don't go out and do things by ourselves. OK. Um, just on public consultation, you'd be aware I've been reason well, maybe you're not aware, I've been quite critical of the fact that the public's been locked out of this one, as in 2009 white paper and the process leading up to it, there was actually quite extensive public consultation. Um, yes. But for the, t for the time being, there's not. So what criteria are you using to select peak organisations that are capable of op offering, I guess, better representation of public opinion than actual consultation with the public? We've, we've run a process of, um, I mean, the 2009 white paper and the consultation process that was undertaken then is, is still relatively fresh. And so what we've done uh, in relation to this so far is to um, uh, consult with um, interested parties um, uh, and, and uh, through think tanks and through industry associations. What? That said, there's nothing to stop any member of the public uh, presenting a view on the issues okay. to the department or to the minister. Who should we, as in if, if we write to Minister Smith, which write to Minister Smith. it'll make its way to you. Yes. But you're not advertising I, 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 I would assume so. I mean... I would hope so. Um, no, what, what I mean is that um, any member of the public 
uh, has the ability to make representations on any aspect of government policy or sure. policy development. Noted. Okay. Um, Chair, I'll just check procedurally. Will I have the opportunity? I can't do bases and US occupation of the country in four minutes. Will there be an opportunity to come are back you, to that later? Are you talking about um, Darwin? <laughs> that was a bit cheeky, well, wasn't it? it has been just already. Just oh, sorry? No, we're not coming back there. So, you'll have so to I've got to do it in four yeah. minutes. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay. Well, that'll be easy. Ah. There are no bases and there's no occupation. Okay, tell us about Stirling. What, what is in the pipeline for Stirling Naval Base in southwest of WA? Shout out to General Hurley, Chief of Defence Force. Uh, there are no concrete plans at all for Stirling at the present time. Will we find out about concrete plans when US Secretary of State and Defence are here in November? Is that when we'll find well, out a, that there uh, are Senator, concrete plans? Senator, that's hypothetical. I think uh, all I can say at the moment is we have no concrete plans for um, use of Stirling. Are there plans that aren't concrete? That are, are there plans in... I'm not trying to fall no, around here. No, but no, no. Other than the continued use as we see the ships come through now. Yeah, not all that often. It's very different to, and I acknowledge openly that it's speculation. It has gone up and down over the years, yeah. that's right. Yeah, it has. Yeah. It's, been, it's actually been quite a quiet spell. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested to know, is there a proposal being worked up or in development anywhere with any of the de defence or minister, if you want to catch this one, um, for uh, expanded, not basing rights, I guess, but uh, expanded interoperability with US naval assets at Stirling? No, it, uh, when the increase or an enhanced engagement with the US Armed Forces in the Pacific was discussed. Uh, there was an order in which issues would be looked at. Sterling was put on that order, but we've done no formal work, no informal work, other than to say it's still on the list for something to be looked at in due course. It sounds as though if something is announced in November, you'd be pretty surprised to hear it then. If something is announced in September, uh, no, November, November, November. I'll be very surprised to hear it. OK, well, that would make two of us, I guess. So we'll just have to see what happens. Um, I'm interested the degree, I might come back to the white paper since we've got you here, Mr Sergeant, um, and it's been my first opportunity to ask, how are you, how are you evaluating the risk uh, posed in a security context of climate change? You are, you've got a difficult task. You are meant to be somehow crystal ball gazing to what our security environment is going to be in the 2030s, because that is the lifetime of the assets and the procurement decisions that will be made arising from your white paper. How do you read the context of climate change in terms of Australian security in the 2030s, and how are you accounting for that in the document you're crafting? Well, we haven't drafted it yet, so... No, no, present tense. I'm aware it's, up to your, it's in process. Look, to the extent that... Um, I mean, it, 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 it's a complicated issue. Um, climate change is likely to have an effect uh, in our region. Um, depending on, you know, and, 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 and there's a range of views on this, but it, 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 you know, to the extent that it has an effect um, in terms of um, sea levels or changing weather patterns or, or you know, that's all um, drought or whatever, um, then that may have some impact on um, security in the sense that it creates um, or is one of the causes of um, you know, natural disasters or crises or, or political or instability. Do you acknowledge, Mr Sergeant, that all of those things that you listed are occurring now? There's a lot in the defence and security literature that says these things are having an impact in the present day. Well, we know that in our region there are disasters and catastrophes and, we, and the ADF has a, a very strong record of supporting the response to that. Yep. But in terms of... Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the sense as to whether, as you're drafting the defence white paper, is this is this going to be a footnote as it was in 09, or is this actually starting to move to the centre of people's thinking that the security environment we operate in in the 2030s will be strongly contoured and defined by changing climate patterns? It will be one of the things that affects the security environment, but there are other large forces in play which are also likely to affect it, such as economic development and population growth. Yeah. Uh, now they, you know, the, the, you know what is what is sort of um, a matter for judgment is the way in which those different forces might interact or um, compound. But um, you know that's pretty speculative when you go that far out. But what we do know is that populations will increase, uh, economic development will increase. Um, this part of the world will become um, richer, um, wealthier, but there will be more. Um, uh, there will, you know, there will be greater competition for resources and, and, and 
and so on. So it, it'll become a more complex environment and the extent to which climate change has an effect on that will be one of the factors which you know the the region as a whole will have to to manage oh, i'm going to move us on because we're very short of time but i guess i could just invite you to at least absorb some of the literature some of it very good of australian academics and defense writers who've been producing material on this for quite a long period of time and hope that that makes it onto your reading list yes i'm, I'm aware of it thanks uh, Mr. and i'm aware of the debates i've just got a couple more and as we are short of time i suspect some of these will need to go on notice i just want to come back to the social impact assessment for the facility in darwin that was released in august 2012. Um, it was a it was a fairly quick study and it looked only at the impact of the 200 to 250 us marines that are stationed um, they're rotating through darwin um, what stands out is that the consultants indicated that there's a moderate risk, there's a low, low risk of, of most of the different kinds of impacts of the things that I've been bringing up, but a moderate risk of incidents of sexual assault due to the US Marine Corps presence. So can you tell us what your interpretation of moderate risks is and what steps you're taking to mitigate that moderate risk? Yes, yes Senator. If you just looked at the risk, you would take that out of context. So if I put it in context, the consultant said the likelihood is unlikely the consequence would be uh, extreme and therefore you end up with that moderate risk. Yep. So if you took it no, in the I, context I you go, that. so the likelihood is unlikely is what the consultant said. Okay, it doesn't actually answer my question. What are you doing to mitigate this moderate risk that's been identified? Okay, it, what we briefed you last time. In fact, the, uh, the Marines are, are conducting themselves very well as ambassadors in this country. They did in this particular uh, rotation. We anticipate that to continue. All right. They are, as always, they are briefed on what their requirements are, how they how they conduct themselves, all that. So I don't anticipate to have that problem. No, so my final, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, so findings 28 and 29 of the report indicate that a substantial impact of assessment <coughs> of the full proposal is required. So that takes us up to a full contingent of it was two and a half thousand or so U.S. Marines. And it goes on to say there'd be no delay in inviting the wider Darwin community to participate in a government initiated social impact statement that gives local people some role in setting boundaries to the growing foreign military presence. So that was what the consultant said. Mm -hmm. There was zero, well, very low public consultation for the first report. So can you tell us what actions are now planned in response to those two recommendations? You, you missed the first part of the, the, the answer before. There, there was consultancy with, uh, with federal government agencies, Northern Territory government agencies. There were particular uh, groups in the community that were engaged as well. Yeah, you didn't hold uh, public meetings or anything like that though, did you? Uh, did there, have been, there has been public consultation, well, not as wide as you may have liked, but there has been consultation. I was at one meeting where I think <laughs> Major one. Michael Krauss attended yeah. and took questions directly from the yeah. audience. I'm just wondering whether, well, let's, let's go or rather For not the quibble. future, sorry. No yeah. more the questions, next, Senator Ludlam. Just the, finish up now, please. I'll, I can finish this answer for you. The next rotation will be another 200 to 250. The rotation after that is anticipated to be about 1,000, 1,100. There will be another impact study uh, similar to this to cover that. <laughs> And then as we, as we go to the future, where we're looking at up to 2,500, no earlier than 16, 17, then we'll continue to do these uh, studies to inform how we will bring these rotations in over the, the coming years. Thank you. Now, we are going to 1.3 Army capabilities. Please. Senator Johnson. That doesn't mean that we finish with Navy necessarily, but we're doing Army now because uh, Chief of Army has to leave. Chair, I have a response for some Oh, sorry, now, we needed those responses. Yes, Mr. Well, King? If, if you want to. Go uh, now. It's relation to the 